Education. And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we will start with the list of questions. I call Sam Gardner. Question number one. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Arms length bodies are reviewed periodically and the review of the Northern Ireland Tours Board and wider tourism structures follows on from my recent review of the Consumer Council and the IREP report in 2009 which reviewed the functions of Invest Northern Ireland. With the success of NI 2012 and indeed 2013, now is an opportune time to undertake this review to ensure that we have the optimum structures in place to deliver the tourism targets set out in the programme for government and the economic strategy. John Hunter, a retired civil servant, has agreed to undertake the review. The review will also look at the opportunity presented by the RPA to maximise the impact of local tourism structures. I call Sam Gardner. Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her uh, response to me. May I ask the Minister that I am glad the Minister agrees with the Ulster Unionist Party that Northern Ireland is a unique tourist destination. Can the Minister tell us uh, how she plans to improve the 9% drop in the number of visitors coming to Northern Ireland for the first time? Well, uh, I think it's been very clear that that may be an Ulster Unionist policy, but they may be agreeing with me, Mr Deputy Speaker, as to the fact that Northern Ireland has a unique uh, proposition. Uh, can I just say to the member that I have looked at the figures which are just out recently in relation uh, to tourists coming to Northern Ireland. I'm very pleased to see uh, another increase in the number of tourists coming to Northern Ireland, and in particular uh, in relation to the GB market, which is our biggest uh, market. Very good to see that the numbers are up in respect of those visitors by 18%. Uh, percent. Uh, I do recognise, however, that there has been a drop in the number of visitors uh, from the Republic of Ireland by some 14%, but overall uh, the figures are up by 6% uh, for those visitors from outside of Northern Ireland uh, into Northern Ireland. In fact, as well, the number of visitor nights um, that have been spent in Northern Ireland has also increased by 5% uh, in the first six months of 2013. So, uh, you know, statistics are there and people can take different stories out of those statistics. But for me, the headline statistic is very encouraging to see that the figures are going yet again in the right direction. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Would the Minister agree with me that the recent C.S. Lewis Festival East Belfast was hugely successful and that was supported by the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and that's a sort of events that we would encourage the Northern Ireland Tourist Board to be involved in in the future? Uh, well, absolutely, and can I commend uh, the member for the work that he put in into the C.S. Lewis Festival. Uh, I was privileged to attend uh, one of the events. I would have liked to have attended more of the events, but unfortunately I was outside of the jurisdiction uh, for most uh, of the festival. I was in Dubai on a trade mission, uh, but I was delighted to see the first C.S. Lewis Festival off the ground. Um, C.S. Lewis, obviously uh, one of our literary stars and one who has not received the attention he should have done in the past. And I think I did say at that event I was able to attend uh, that I really did believe that, uh, like the Beckett Festival in Enniskillen, we can make these literary festivals uh, a real, um, if you like, annual event on the calendar for people to come to the particular areas of Northern Ireland uh, and to really get to know about the individuals involved. And can I say just in parenthesis that I was really very pleased to see that at last C.S. Lewis has been honoured with a memorial stone in Westminster Abbey. I think that was a very fitting thing to happen as well. I call Patsy McLoone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I guess we have slashed out of Kamaias Fragra, and I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, could the Minister uh, provide us with some detail as to what discussions she has had with other executive colleagues around the future of the Northern Ireland Tourist Board? Well, I haven't had any discussions with executive colleagues because the tourist review has just begun. Uh, and uh, as I've indicated, John Hunter is undertaking that review, and he will speak to whoever he needs to speak to, and then he will come back. Uh, with his uh, views on the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and where, where there is a need for change, he will point out that change, and where there is a need for no change, I'm sure he will point that out as well. So, uh, no, uh, tourism sits under uh, my portfolio, uh, and therefore uh, I have taken the decision that there needs to be a review. 
I call Phyllis Flanagan. I would like to thank the Minister for her answers. Um, in her substantive answer, she mentioned the drop in visitors for, from the south. Um, and can I ask the Minister if she would like to take this opportunity um, to call on people that are out on the streets and engaging in, in parades and protests to come off the streets because it is having a negative impact on visitor numbers coming from the rest of Ireland? Uh, can I say to the member, I think he would do well uh, to read an article today by Ivan Little in the Belfast Telegraph, which said that Saturday was a triumph for hope over hype. And I think there was a lot of hype uh, on the way up to last Saturday. And undoubtedly, there will be some people, even in this chamber, who may be disappointed uh, that the event passed over peacefully. Uh, I have to say that uh, it is disappointing that there are those who try to make political points while the rest of us are interviewed. And if the member wants, I will give way. I call Barry Mickledoff. I may I got a last can call you. Cash to a dog. Question number two. The Northern Ireland Economic Strategy sets out the Executive's collective approach to growing the local economy and creating prosperity and employment. By growing the economy and creating skilled, high-paying employment opportunities, we will encourage our talented people to remain in Northern Ireland and hopefully attract back those who may have emigrated in recent years. Latest available data shows that the number of employee jobs increased by more than 5,000 in the year to June 2013, with over 3,000 of that increase coming in the last quarter. By the end of September, Invest and I had promoted over 17,200 jobs in the programme for government period. This is significantly ahead of schedule with respect to the delivery of our programme for government jobs targets. Indeed, of the 6,600 jobs promoted through the Jobs Fund, 3,525 new jobs have already been created. I call Barry McElduff for supplementary. Uh, uh, can I say to the Minister that given that thousands of our Best educated young people are in the likes of Australia at this time, out of economic necessity, not choice. And given that many are saying that there is nothing to entice them home by way of job opportunity, is there any determination on the part of the Minister and her department to direct graduate job schemes and potential inward investment to those areas of highest emigration and unemployment, including West Tyrone? Well, can, first of all, I said to the member that you know, he makes a statement that there's nothing to come home to when he knows that, particularly in his own constituency, we have made a number of very significant job announcements in this past short time. In Terex, in Telestack, in Frylight, all have uh, come forward with jobs, and he should be welcoming those job opportunities and actually saying that there are job opportunities in his constituency for people to come back to. So it's not just about perception of those young people uh, who leave for whatever reason, and sometimes they leave for economic reasons, other times they leave uh, to gain experience in different countries, and I think that's a good thing for Northern Ireland as long as we have the jobs available for them to come back to. And we have those jobs available in West Tyrone, and he should be going forward and making sure that those young people know about those job opportunities. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister able to provide a breakdown of the number of people who are leaving Northern Ireland and those that are coming in to sort of give an assessment of, of the figure that, that other people sort of um, give off about that nobody's doing anything? Well, actually, over this last 15 years, the trend has been for net immigration uh, into Northern Ireland, uh, with on average around 22,000 people each year coming to settle uh, here in Northern Ireland. Uh, in 2011-2012, immigration into Northern Ireland was 23,000, so that's people actually coming in to live in Northern Ireland. Uh, but last year, uh, the uh, figure for those that emigrated was 25,000 people emigrating from Northern Ireland. So there was a 2,000, uh, if you like, uh, net plus for us last year, whereas over the past 15 years, it has tended to be in and around uh, the fact that there are more people coming into Northern Ireland than leaving Northern Ireland. So as you can see, there are quite a lot of people going out of Northern Ireland, but also there are quite a lot of people uh, coming into Northern Ireland. So it sort of levels itself out uh, ordinarily throughout the year. I call Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Um, can I just ask, are there any specific initiatives to attract back those people who have left? Um, any specific initiatives to target them and, and, and tell them about all the opportunities you have mentioned? 
Well, one of the ways we uh, do that now is through the Northern Ireland Connections piece. When we go out into the different regions, we always make sure that we touch base with those people who have an interest in Northern Ireland, who are from Northern Ireland, or who generally uh, want to help Northern Ireland to grow. Uh, and I've been uh, very pleased to make a number of contacts through that Northern Ireland Connections piece. Uh, a lot of times with some young people out in the different regions, whether it's South Africa uh, or America or indeed in Dubai, just very recently. Uh, and we do want to say to those people to talk positively about Northern Ireland, to talk about uh, the uh job opportunities that there are here at home and then to try and get those people to come home uh, after they have gained experience in a different market because that experience that they have gained can be a real game changer for us in Northern Ireland then when they bring that experience back to us. Moving on, I call Sean Rogers. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Department does not keep statistics of insolvencies broken down by council areas. The total number of sole traders and limited companies in the South Down constituency that have entered bankruptcy or compulsory liquidation in this last five years is 296. This figure does not include companies which have entered into a creditor's voluntary liquidation or an administration. I call John Thank you, Minister, for, for our answers thus far. And ask her. What steps has the Minister taken to improve access to credit, particularly for the small and medium-sized businesses? Well, there are a whole range of access to credit uh, programmes available now, right from the very small business loans that are available from £1,000 up to £50,000, uh, and then, of course, the Growth Loan Fund, which has been very successful, uh, rolled out by White Rock Partners on our behalf, and they have made, I think, just sub of 60 uh, loans in, uh, right across Northern Ireland in terms of that. So, Invest Northern Ireland have created, I think it's six access to finance programmes now. Uh, that's a recognition uh, that the banks haven't been uh, working with small and medium sized businesses in the way we would have liked. Uh, and indeed the most latest way in which we have intervened is uh, with the agri-loan scheme uh, where we hope to help those people who want to have an integrated part to play in our agri-loan uh, food sector that we can help them to make that initial investment first of all in the poultry sector uh, to allow them to get the house up so that they can develop then uh, for the poultry sector and, and help to grow the industry. So we have taken uh, a lot of interventions in relation to the access to finance. Moving on, I call Paul Gervin. Question number four, Minister. My department and Invest Northern Ireland have been working with the full range of businesses across the South Antrim constituency in this last 18 months to encourage business growth and increase employment opportunities. In total, Invest Northern Ireland has made 447 offers to locally and foreign owned companies in the constituency between April 2012 and September of this year. Invest NI has provided 9.7 million of assistance that will contribute to 34.5 million of investment and promote almost 336 uh, new jobs in the South Antrim area. In addition, over 30 offers of support worth a total of 4 million will see 11 million pounds invested in research and development by companies in the South Antrim area. There have been 119 new business starts in the constituency over the same period, creating over 100 new jobs, and there are currently 47 job funds projects at various stages of development, with the potential to create over 200 new jobs in total. I call Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for that report, and uh, in doing so, uh, welcome those jobs that have been promoted and those that have actually been created. Uh, Invest and I have a very large land bank within the South Antrim area uh, and pr primarily the Global Point site. Uh, what is the intention with that, uh, that land bank that they currently have? Well, the member is right. We do hold a, a lot of land in the South Antrim constituency um, in seven locations. Um, we have 394 acres, of which 106 acres remain available to support economic development projects brought through, forward by qualifying uh, business. Uh, he mentions uh, Global Point uh, Business Park, and of course, while full planning approval for the business uh, park was achieved in 2008, a number of uh, the planning conditions have resulted in protracted engagement uh, with stakeholders by Invest NI to ensure uh, a satisfactory resolution. And I certainly would like to see a resolution in relation to Global Point uh, as soon as possible. 
I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer and congratulate her on the jobs and the work that's, that's gone on. Um, but where it comes to Invest NI, is there a sort of friendly way of working with them to make sure that where they feel they can't help somebody, people are looking at how else they can be helped to help businesses that are there? Because there are one or two that fall by the way and find that they get a very firm no rather than a, a yes maybe. Well, I'm, I am disappointed to hear that because I would have hoped uh, that if Invest and I are not able to help a particular business, particularly a small business, that they would signpost them to other areas of help, maybe to the enterprise, the local enterprise NI, who have been very uh, helpful to small uh, businesses uh, in my own constituency, and I'm sure he recognises the work that Enterprise NI do right across Northern Ireland, and in fact they actually run the Regional Start programme for Invest Northern Ireland. Uh, but if there's any specific uh, issue that uh, the member has, I'm quite happy to have a look at it for him. Can I remind you, this is a particular constituency question? And I now call Jerry Kelly. Thank you, the Minister, for her answer up to now, and I uh, thank the, the uh, Chair for uh, warning me where, where not to go. But I did want to expand this out a little to ask the, the, the Minister how she, how she will ensure people across the North will get fair and equitable uh, employment. I think the question is very particular on this occasion, so we'll move on. Jim Wells, please. Number five. Uh, new hotel developments may benefit from capital support from Invest Northern Ireland if the promoter can demonstrate that the project is market-driven with the capability of attracting visitors from outside Northern Ireland and not displacing business from similar projects. New hotel projects offering at least 30 rooms may be considered for support. I call Jim Wells. As the ministers may be aware, the, the former Abbey Lodge Hotel in Down Patrick was demolished six years ago, and uh, I, both as a councillor then and as an MLA, strongly welcomed the uh, planning application which was approved for a new hotel. But since then, nothing has happened, and I wonder will she continue to keep this matter under review and see what can be done? Because it's, I think it's, it's a dreadful situation that a town the size of Down Patrick doesn't have a modern hotel of any description. Well, uh, the member is right, and indeed there were some discussions uh, back in uh, 2009-2010 uh, between Invest NI Tourism team and those who were seeking to develop a new hotel on the Abbey Lodge, uh, former Abbey Lodge hotel site. However, that didn't reach a positive conclusion, and uh, there's been no further contact uh, since December of uh, 2010. I would say to the member, however, of course, if there are, are new plans or if they have been revisited, then of course uh, we stand ready to look at those and uh, will, of course, be as helpful as we can in all the circumstances. I call Karen McEvitt. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her response. And I'm sure she knows how important the tourism sector is to the good people of South Down, particularly as we see it as a, um, economic, uh, a good economic recovery opportunity. But, uh, and I welcome the efforts uh, locally for uh, a new hotel um, in Down Patrick. But can I ask the Minister um, uh, to, how, um, she would, what has she done to improve the competitiveness with hotels, given that in the Republic uh, they have a VAT rate of only 9%? Yes, indeed they do, and it's one of the big issues for the Northern Ireland Hotel Federation. It's one of their five T's that they talk about now, and uh, of course that is a Westminster uh, issue, and I have said to them that I will assist them in any way that I can, because uh, it is uh, very difficult for those uh, hotels and accommodation providers, and indeed those that provide uh, food and drink, uh, when they are along the border, they're competing with people just across the border who have a different VAT rate and a very attractive uh, VAT rate. Uh, so we will work with the uh, representative bodies in uh, the tourism sector, uh, along with the Tourist Board and Tourism Ireland, to try and make uh, companies as competitive as we possibly can. That may well be uh, through training, uh, through making sure that we have all of the appropriate skills that we can get an edge in respect of that piece of work. Uh, but it's also through the Jobs Fund, and we have used the Jobs Fund, the Tourism Development Scheme, uh, and the money available from Invest Northern Ireland for hotels uh, is capital money, but we've also used the Jobs Fund to help uh, hotels right across Northern Ireland uh, to take on new staff uh, and to grow in that way. So the Jobs Fund is available to, hotel, to the hotel sector as well. I call Maeve McLaughlin. 
No, thank the Minister um, for our answer. Uh, specifically, and I listened to the Minister's comments in relation to the Jobs Fund, but specifically in, re- in relation to the local economy and, I suppose, the, the opportunity to increase the return uh, to the economy from the local hotel industry. Does the Minister have specific proposals on how she will activate that? Well, as I've indicated, the Jobs Fund has been very useful uh, in relation to that in in our own city. Uh, £70,000 was offered to the City uh, of Derry Hotels Limited for a £500,000 expansion, a very um, well-thought-out expansion, and I have the pleasure uh, to visit the expansion that took place there. So uh, it is about trying to make us more competitive uh, and to use our finances uh, in a way uh, that doesn't fall foul of of European state aid rules, uh, and that's always a challenge for us when we look at new ways to help an industry. But we will continue to work with the Hotels Federation and indeed all of the other representative bodies uh, in all of the campaigns that they run. Moving on, I call Bronwyn McGahan. Gourmet Yogurt, question six. Uh, just looking at business closures and isolation does not give the full picture. Whilst over 23,000 businesses did cease trading, almost 24,000 businesses began trading over the same period. Also, when Northern Ireland is compared to the rest of the UK, it has the lowest business death rate of all 12 regions. But it is an inevitable part of being an outward-looking economy that less competitive businesses will close down, and that is why Invest Northern Ireland focuses its support on local firms that are highly competitive and export-focused. I call Bronwyn McGahan. I I thank the Minister for her response. Given the extent of business closures and the extent of our current economic challenges, would the Minister agree that our capacity for economic recovery would be enhanced if we had the necessary tools to grow the economy? Uh, which is why we keep pushing for corporation tax to come to Northern Ireland and we look forward to a decision uh, by our Prime Minister uh, in, after the Scottish referendum takes place uh, next year uh, and if we are able to secure corporation tax then that will certainly uh, give us a competitive edge particularly uh, against the Republic of Ireland which has a, a low level of corporation tax and if we have that tool in our box I think it will make a real difference. I call Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that apart from difficult trading conditions, a recent report has shown that many businesses have been caused to cease trading because of the activities of banks and in particular RBS. Uh, would the Minister indicate to the House what in- steps she intends to take to ensure that any investigation into the actions of Ulster Bank in putting people into liquidation so they can seize their assets will be looked at by either the Treasury or the Department of Business uh, in their investigations into the scandalous activities of RBS. Well, clearly the findings of uh, RBS Independent Lending Review Report and indeed the Tomlinson uh, Report on Bank's Treatment of Businesses uh, is very distressing uh, to those concerned. Uh, And the key finding from Tomlinson's report that there are circumstances uh, in which banks are unnecessarily engineering a default uh, to move businesses out of local management and into their turnaround divisions, uh, generating revenue through fees, uh, increased margins and devalued assets is a very, very serious uh, matter for us here. Now, as I understand it, and I stand to be corrected, uh, the report by Tomlinson uh, only covered RBS uh, globally, and I would be very interested to see uh, what the situation is in respect uh, of the Ulster Bank. And uh, I do welcome the fact that the um, the bank has appointed uh, a leading firm to look into these matters, but he can rest assured that both myself and the Finance Minister uh, will be raising this issue with the bank in the very near future. Um, We will also be taking the matter to the next Joint Ministerial Task Force uh, on banking and access to finance, because it is a hugely serious issue, and I know that he has met, uh, as indeed I have, with with, uh, individuals and with companies that have made uh, allegations such as are in the Tomlinson and report, uh, t- uh, and therefore we need to really bottom these issues out uh, and try and deal with what we've, le- what we've been left with. And if it is the case uh, that this practice went on in Northern Ireland, uh, as I said in the radio last week, it's an absolute scandal. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number seven. 
One of the programme for government's key commitments is to achieve £1 billion of investment in our economy by March 2015. I am very pleased to say that despite the uncertain economic conditions, we have achieved over £900 million of investment so far, and I expect to substantially exceed the original target by the end of the current programme for government uh, period. I call Lord Morrow. Uh, I thank the Minister for her reply and that very encouraging answer. Could I ask the Minister, on reflection, does she feel that she underestimated in this instance? Well, I suppose that's the. Uh, uh, I should have expected that that was going to be the question. Um, but the original programme for government target was set uh, right at the height uh, of the recession. Uh, it took account of the potential uh, negative impact of factors such as the potential changes to regional aid. Uh, which we have been successful on, and we should not uh, forget that we have been successful in retaining uh, regional aid here for Northern Ireland. So I believe the target at the time uh, was the right target, and indeed some considered it to be uh, stretching when uh, we set that target. But I am delighted to see that we are so close to meeting it uh, so early on, and be assured uh, that this will not slow down our search for investment in Northern Ireland. Indeed, I want us to uh, exceed the target and exceed it well. I call Rosie McCorley. Can I ask the Minister, has this new investment uh, created uh, and stimulated economic recovery and has it created uh, uh, jobs equally across the North? I don't understand the question. Well, you know, the uh, £900 million uh, which has been invested has been invested right across Northern Ireland. It has not just been invested in one part of Northern Ireland. I have had uh, the privilege to attend many events right across Northern Ireland announcing investment for communities uh, and therefore that will continue to be the case going into next year. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, and could I uh, welcome the success of the Minister in terms of inward investment to Northern Ireland and I hope that the target of one billion will in fact be exceeded and uh, exceeded well. Uh, but the, the problem for uh, North Belfast... Can, can the member come to his question, please? Well, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to just put it into context. But the, the problem for North Belfast man is that he, he does not see the benefit of investment in the North Belfast constituency. Question, and I would ask the Minister, is there any way of targeting that uh, very welcome investment. Well, we've been through this uh, uh, time and time again, and you know, I, I listen to people from North Belfast and West Belfast complain about jobs and investment coming to another part of the city, and I ask myself, how far is it to travel to that other part of the city? And it really does bemuse me as to how one part of the city getting uh, investment is in some way bad news for another part of the city. It should be good news for the whole of Northern Ireland that we bring investment in in the way in which we've been able to bring investment in over this past period of time. And you know, there have been great advances right across Northern Ireland in terms of job availability, whether that's through the Jobs Fund or in foreign direct investment. And sometimes I hear members opposite saying, well, we haven't had enough foreign direct investment, but that totally moves away from the fact that there are a lot of uh, jobs being created through the Jobs Fund and there are a lot of businesses starting up in their constituencies and they need as much help and assistance from their elected representatives as in fact the foreign direct investment does. So we should be pleased and delighted about the jobs coming in from wherever they come in, whether they're locally owned companies or foreign directly owned companies. I call Stephen Mutry. Question number eight, Deputy Speaker. Northern Ireland exports in 2012-13 totaled £5.7 billion. In the first six months of this year, pleased to report exports are up 3% over the same period in 2012 to £2.98 billion. Invest Northern Ireland provides a range of solutions to assist local manufacturing and services businesses to export. Since April, it has arranged 31 trade missions, with a further 32 planned over the next six months. The 2014-15 visit programme will include around 70 events, a number of which I plan to lead. And that is the end of our period of listed oral questions, and we now move on to topical questions that have been listed for the Minister. 
uh, uh, Ms. Michelle McElveen's name has been withdrawn. I call Sammy Wilson. Can I first of all congratulate the Minister on the efforts which she made to ensure that Northern Ireland was not included in the carbon tax, which probably saved about 15 per cent in energy bills. But could she tell the Assembly what, she, uh, what con um, contact she has had with Ministers in England to discuss changes in other green taxes which could help to reduce the bills for electricity and energy which people are currently facing today? I thank the member for his comments and indeed also thank him for the work that he carried out uh, when he was Minister for Finance and Personnel. Um, the Prime Minister has been very clear that he wants to look again uh, at green taxes, although I, I read in the paper that he was referring it, uh, to something else green, but I will better not uh, say that word uh, in this House or I might be ruled as unparliamentary. But um, can I say that there is a need to look at these issues again in the context of where we find ourselves? Uh, we uh, listened very carefully yesterday to what the Chancellor had to say uh, about the reduction of bills. As far as I understand, that just affects uh, Great Britain. It does not automatically flow over into Northern Ireland. I do, of course, wait on his autumn statement to see the detail of all of that. And once that is there, we will, of course, be in touch uh, with the relevant ministers. I call Sammy Wilson. Last week, a report indicated that 42% of people in Northern Ireland live in fuel poverty. Would the Minister agree that one of the, one of the factors contributing to that is the, the policy of relying increasingly on renewable energy? And would she indicate to us, uh, if we are to meet the target of 40% by 2020, what the estimate will be of the, the increase on the average energy bill for each household in Northern Ireland? Well, as the member knows, the targets uh, were set in the programme for government, which every minister signed up to at that time when the programme for government uh, came out, uh, and they were set uh, at 40% uh, for Northern Ireland. Um, the reason they were set uh, in that way is we believe that we need a mix of sources for our energy. There's reasons for that. Uh, security of supply, of course, is one of those reasons. We need to be sustainable in everything that we do uh, as well, uh, and we need to have good value. Value for money. So it's in the good value for money context, given where we've been through that, I think it is a sensible thing to do, uh, to look at our uh, strategic energy framework again. Of course, when the Prime Minister uh, and the uh, DEC Minister have looked uh, at energy prices, we will then have a look at ours to see if there's anything that we can do uh, in response. But we will have to wait for the autumn statement, which is out on Thursday. I call Rosie McCorley. Can I ask the minister, can, or can I uh, refer the minister to a previous, uh, a recent PwC report which indicates that the economy is heading towards recovery, but that it's possible that the average household could lose £550 a year because of projected interest rate increases. So can I ask the minister what steps uh, will she take to ensure that the economy uh, will, will recover? But it will be fair and inequitable, and also that ordinary families you, will not question. suffer undue hardship. Well, uh, I don't set the interest rates. The Bank of England sets the interest rates, and uh, the uh, Governor has been very clear that he would not be looking at those until the unemployment rate uh, nationally uh, went below 7%, and the national unemployment rate at present is 7.6%. Our rate is 7.3%. I do, however, welcome the Ernst & Young and the PwC reports, uh, which came out about two weeks ago, uh, each of them showing that Northern Ireland is going into to growth mode again at a faster level than they had first thought. Uh, I welcome that and I do hope that members from right across the House will join with us in trying to grow Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, would you agree with me that campaigns such Sorry, as... Uh, apologies, I, I've forgotten to call Rosie McCorney for a second supplementary. Apologies. Rosie McCorney. Thank you, Stuart. I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I, can I uh, refer again to the PwC report and the previous report on fiscal powers? And what they tell me is that uh, it's time we secured uh, the necessary tools to, to grow our economy so that it's fair and equitable and meets the needs of our people. So um, can the Minister tell me how her department intends to address the issues raised in both those reports? Gormayogar. 
Well, you know, it's very interesting when people talk about us getting fiscal powers to the Assembly. It's as if it's some gift that's coming down to us from Westminster. These all cost money. And who's going to pay for these fiscal powers? I mean, I remember when we were having the discussion about corporation tax, which we very much want to see coming to Northern Ireland. There were elements in society that said, oh, it was too much money. We couldn't afford to have corporation powers given to the Assembly. So I don't know what other powers the member is speaking about, but they come with a price tag, Mr Deputy Speaker, and people need to realise that. And I now call Stuart Dixon. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister. Minister, would you agree with me that campaigns are like Small Business Saturday back in Belfast uh, and other campaigns that take place uh, across Northern Ireland are vital to support not only our high streets, our small businesses, our industrial estates and indeed our village and corner shops? Well, I very much welcome Small Business Saturday, which uh, I think is this Saturday, the 7th of December, and uh, uh, I've already been involved at my local constituency uh, to try and support uh, small businesses there, and I'm sure members from across the House will do the same in their own constituencies. It's important that we give support to small businesses to allow them to grow, and you know, it has been a very difficult time, particularly for our retailers, uh, and I do hope that they get the support that they need uh, over the Christmas period. Period. Back in Belfast, of course, was a very successful uh, initiative that we undertook early last year, uh, and uh, I very much hope that that has given benefit to the retailers in Belfast. And we look forward to working with small businesses right across Northern Ireland. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Therefore, Minister, I'm sure you would agree with me and indeed share my dismay when someone coming on the radio this morning, who's just about, I understand, to join Belfast City Council, uh, dismissed the role of the high street and said that high street shopping was dead. Well, I do not accept that in one way. Because I think, uh, yes, we have the internet now, but I've seen so many uh, retailers actually embrace the internet in a very clever way to uh, allow people to view things on the internet, even purchase things on the internet, but also to draw them in uh, to their shops. uh, And I think it's referred to as bricks and clicks. So that the high street still stays important, but that obviously they have moved with the times as well. So I do not accept that. Not in one way, and I look forward to uh, the Small Business Saturday motion, which I think comes up at the end of today's business. I call Jim Wells. Um, Could the Minister give me her assessment of the uh, performance of Titanic Centre in its first year opening? And um, has she any views on the potential targets for the second year of this major tourist attraction? Well, I thank the member for his question. And since opening on the 31st of March 2012 until the end of September this year, uh, Titanic Belfast has welcomed almost 1.3 million visitors. I think that's a, a tremendous figure. Uh, on the 5th of August this year, uh, the facility welcomed the one millionth visitor from County Kildare. Um, was delighted uh, that it was an out-of-state visitor that had come uh, to Belfast. And I'm confident that in its second year uh, of operation uh, that we will welcome well over half a million people uh, to visit Titanic Belfast. I call Jim Wells. Obviously those numbers are are extremely encouraging. Uh, Is she confident that there isn't a novelty value in the first year and that there will be a huge degree of interest as this building initially comes on stream? How does she think it will be able to maintain the success for succeeding years? Well, I think uh, it's important to look at the source of our visitors uh, when you mention novelty value. And of course, it is something that I've been uh, asked before uh, because it did have such a tremendous year in 2012. And if we look at at the source of markets up to August 2013, uh, 29% of the visitors were from the home market, were from Northern Ireland, uh, 27% from the Republic of Ireland, 17 from Great Britain, and 27% from the rest of the world. So I think that's a very good breakdown because it shows that there's growth potential in all of the markets there. We weren't flooded by local people coming in the first year. Uh, We weren't flooded with people coming from a particular market. They're all very strongly performing uh, sectors and I think that there's scope there to really sell Titanic Belfast to the rest of the world and get them to come to Belfast. I call Gerry Kelly. Given the uh, recent uh, public accounts uh, committee report, which was entitled uh, Invest NI, a performance review, there was uh, long-standing issues identified, as the Minister will be aware, around uh, setting uh, targets within that organisation. So could the Minister tell us what target-setting measures 
uh, she uh, intends to introduce uh, to measure uh, on outcomes. I refer the member to the Independent Review of Economic Policy, uh, which took place in 2009, which very clearly said that I should not be setting uh, targets, uh, sub-regional targets for Northern Ireland, as it would be a disincentive to those people who wanted to come and invest into Northern Ireland. And I would refer him to that part of that uh, Public Accounts Committee report, which says that selective financial assistance has been used right across Northern Ireland. Not in one part of Northern Ireland, right across Northern Ireland, and I would be obliged if he could look at that. I call Jerry Kelly. I go on previous lesson, Ara Lahan I thank the Minister for uh, part of the, uh, her answer. Um, would she uh, consider that the best test to invest in I am their performance is actually in measuring actual outcomes? That means actual jobs created and how long they last, as opposed to uh, basing it on uh, investor, uh, reporting on investor targets. And I think that we should look at output, and in that respect, we should look at the amount of money that was given in selective financial assistance and the percentage of that that went outside of Greater Belfast, and I'm sure he'll be glad to look at those numbers. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, does she see real job opportunities developing at Harland and Wolfe following the new um, large oil rig that has just arrived from Brazil? Would it be fair to say that the yard is open for business, business is competitive and is skilled up for work? I thank the member for his question and uh, indeed uh, I just noticed the rig as I came over the M3 this morning, a very impressive uh, piece of work it is Uh, and as I understand it the Harland and Wolf are to take on 600 skilled tradesmen and they have been recruited to work on on this rig, the biggest ever oil rig refurbished uh, in Belfast and of those at least 200 I am told will be from Northern Ireland. Uh, 200 from Scotland and northeast of England, and the rest from Poland uh, and Lithuania, countries which continue uh, with uh, a tradition of shipyard uh, working. So there definitely will be an economic benefit uh, to Belfast, albeit uh, these will be short-term jobs, as I understand it, but will be an opportunity to allow people to become skilled uh, in this area. The renewable energy area as well will then be able to take those skills uh, and use them in other places. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you. Thank the Minister for answer. Does the Minister see uh, further developments at Harland and Wolf for perhaps a wind turbine project and for the renewable industry generally and obviously for the upskilling? Well, of course, Dong Energy are uh, in Belfast Harbour present in uh, a very large logistics hub. They are doing uh, some very impressive work there in the renewable field, uh, particularly with substations that go off then uh, into uh, the the channel, the uh, English Channel. Um, So there is a lot of work going on down in Belfast Harbour, and I know from meeting with the Harbour Commissioners recently that they have plans for further expansion in the renewable energy area. Uh, we welcome that because there are good job opportunities, good skilled job opportunities available uh, in this area, and uh, we will work with Harland and Wolf and indeed uh, Belfast Harbour to ensure that we can support them whenever we can. I call Barry McElduff. Uh, uh, would the Minister agree that more can and should be done by her department to ensure that everyone has equal access to quality broadband coverage, not least in rural areas? Uh, yes, and that's why Northern Ireland is uh, the best connected in the whole of the United Kingdom when it comes to broadband. Uh, he knows that's my position, and I'm sure that's his position as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, while acknowledging you know, significant investment, uh, I want to ask the Minister if she does accept, particularly in terms of businesses, uh, those businesses which continue to experience problems with broadband because of their rural location, they're effectively being disadvantaged in terms of competitiveness. Which is why the broadband fund, which is out to tender at this present moment in time, I hope will be operational early next year. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all congratulate the Minister on the work that she does in tourism uh, across the board and uh, some of the figures that she has outlined earlier are very impressive. Could I ask the Minister 
Would you confirm that under the review of public administration and in line with the review that she has taken of the tourist board, that in the future there will be increased council stroke local approach to tourism? I very much hope that that is the case and uh, the the way in which we want to see tourism developed in Northern Ireland is that there are nine destinations across Northern Ireland uh, that they will all compete with each other for visitors and people coming to stay Uh, and I hope that the local councils will very much take a leadership role in relation to those destination uh, areas and that they will work with the industry closer than they have been to date. And that concludes question time.